Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Henrik Udalan. I'm the director of PRIO, the Peace Research Institute Oslo. It is my great pleasure to bid you all a warm welcome to this year's PRIO Annual Peace Address. In the PRIO Annual Peace Address series, we invite speakers from all around the globe, from a range of backgrounds and fields, academia, journalism, politics, activism, to speak on the topic of significance for peace and conflict in our world today. These are people who have insights to share on topics relevant to PRIO's mission to produce knowledge that can help guide, uh, build and maintain peace. At PRIO, we've chosen the motto Engaged Excellence to encapsulate our approach to this mission. And I feel confident in saying that our speakers today have both engagement and excellence in spades. Due to the pandemic, this year's address, as with so many other events, is being held digitally. While it is, of course, a shame not to be able to invite you all to be with us in person and to hold the usual reception at PRIO HQ after the event, this year's digital setup does provide us with an opportunity to make the live event available to a broader, more international audience than we usually are able to cater to. A recording of the event will also be made available online so that those unable to attend today's live event will still be able to benefit from the interventions of our speakers. This year, the Peace Address is being held as part of the Oslo Peace Days a week-long series of events celebrating Oslo as a city of peace, hosted by PRIO, the Norwegian Nobel Institute, the Nobel Peace Center, the University of Oslo, and the city of Oslo. I encourage you all to check out the other events in Oslo Peace Days. There's plenty of interesting and inspiring discussion and debate going on. The theme of this year's PRIO Annual Peace Address is Youth, and peace building. In the context of discussions of peace, conflict and security, young people are often getting a bad rap. Sometimes portrayed as passive victims, sometimes as perpetrators of violence, the youth contribution is at risk of seeming a primarily negative one. These perceptions of youth in conflict situations are not entirely unfounded. Clearly, young people have the potential to be a vulnerable, uh, vulnerable group in the face of violent conflict and societal instability. And research, including my own, shows that there can, under certain circumstances, be an association between large youth cohorts and increased risk of political violence. However, this is very far from being the whole story. The importance of youth activism has become increasingly apparent in recent years, with young people setting the agenda on issues of critical importance for peace and security, both locally and globally, and challenging established narratives and generational power dynamics. As the UN Security Council recognized in 2015 with its resolution 2250 on youth, peace and security, Young people are also important agents of positive social change, making unique and invaluable contributions to peace building and conflict resolution. As the resolution points out, engaged and empowered youth are crucial for sustainable, inclusive and successful peace efforts. As I've also investigated in my own research, large youth cohorts represent a demographic dividend with the potential to make a significant contribution to the prosperity and stability of the society in which they find themselves. But in order to realize this dividend, we need inclusive structures and processes, and we need the voices of young people to be heard. With the 2020 PRIO Annual Peace Address, we want to highlight and explore this positive contribution of youth in international peace and security through a discussion with two exemplars of youth peace activism, youth leaders Hasher Sharif and Ilvad Elman. 
I'll return to more thorough introduction of our speakers shortly, but for now I will just say that they both have made outstanding contributions to peace efforts in the respective regions in which they are based, as well as playing an important role in international processes through the UN system. We are very happy to have this opportunity to have them present their views on the youth peace and security agenda and to engage them in a dialogue on these important issues. Following Hasher and Ilvad's presentations, there will be a moderated panel discussion. Due to time constraints, we won't be taking questions from the audience for this. However, I encourage you to get involved and comment on the event on social media using the hashtag Peace Address 2020. I'd also like to draw your attention to a resource page we've posted on the PRIO website with a curated list of PRIO research relevant to the theme of today's event. You can find a link on the event page for the peace address on the PRIO website. And I encourage you all to go and check that after the event. Before we hand over to our esteemed speakers to deliver this year's peace address, it is an honor to introduce Jayatma Vikaramanayaka the UN Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, who has kindly agreed to open today's meeting. Jayatma has been Youth Envoy since 2017. She has held a long list of prestigious posts in the course of her still relatively short career, including Secretary to the Secretary General of the Parliament of Sri Lanka, Youth Lead Negotiator in the International Youth Task Force of the World Conference on Youth, official youth delegate to the UN Ministry of Youth Affairs and Skills Development and senator in the Sri Lankan Youth Parliament. She is also the founder of the Sri Lankan hashtag Generation Movement, a group advocating for the meaningful civic and political participation of youth, especially young women and young people with minority backgrounds. Jayatma, over to you. Thank you very much, Henrik. I want to thank Priyo and my colleagues Hajar and Ilvad for inviting me to join you all today. It's truly an honor to be in the company of Hajar and Ilvad and call them both friends. They inspire me every day with their resilience, perseverance and commitment. And I really hope and wish I can be like them when I grow up, maybe one day. <laughs> we uh, right now in the midst of an unprecedented global challenge. The COVID-19 pandemic has swept through our world, leaving everyday life as we know it at a standstill. <clears throat> but as usual on media and the speeches of politicians, we have seen a focus on the small minority of young people who disregard the guidelines and instructions going into parties, pubs and beaches. Nowhere in the news did we hear about young peace builders in Kenya and Cameroon who immediately adapted their peace building organizations and networks to prepare their communities to face COVID-19. The news didn't focus on the many young innovators, crowdfunding and 3D printing PPE in China and Italy. The news didn't tell us about the scouts, the girl guides, the Red Cross volunteers running awareness campaigns, hand washing campaigns in Haiti and Jordan. I often think that this is the story of young people, particularly of the young peace builders that we see every day. As you said, Henrik, public disclosure often portrays young people as an irresponsible, self-interested group. We quickly categorize young men as easily attracted to violence and part of gangs and extremist groups and young women as always as victims of those scenarios. But contrary to these popular narratives, if we care to take a closer look at the communities most affected, what conflicts, disasters and crises teach us all over again is that young people are not only the most resilient, but also the most innovative and resourceful during turbulent times. Born into and growing up in an exceedingly interconnected world, young people understand very well that solidarity is the name of the game. They understand that just like the COVID-19 pandemic, conflict, violence, inequality and climate change do not stop at national boundaries, that none of us is safe unless we all are. That is why what happened five years ago on a day like tomorrow is so important.
On the 9th of December 2015, for the first time, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 2250 and recognized the crucial and positive role young people play in maintaining international peace and security. Therefore, this is an opportune moment to take stock of the youth peace and security agenda in the last five years, its progress, wins, and its challenges and gaps for the many years to come. Since 2015, we have seen an increased recognition of youth in global conversations on peace and security. An independent study on youth peace and security was conducted and presented to the Security Council in 2018. Several UN political and peacekeeping missions and OSCE offices have recruited youth advisors. After the resolution 2215 2015, two subsequent resolutions, each more progressive than the other, 2419 and 2535 have been adopted by the Security Council. We have had in several locations young people briefing the Security Councils on issues beyond youth peace and security. Despite the global pandemic, progress has been made to advance the YPS agenda and just recently the African Union adopted a continental framework for youth peace and security. And in April, the first Secretary General's report on youth peace and security was also presented to the Council. I believe that this event itself is a testament to the increased attention and focus the youth peace and security agenda is receiving. But is this enough? Even though we see an increased global conversations, we are yet to see momentum at the country level. Only a handful of countries have committed to develop national action plans on youth peace and security. Very rarely we see youth perspectives being taken into account in national security strategies. In the context of a shrinking civic space around the world, youth organizations are being censored and young activists around the world are being targeted and retaliated against for the crime of speaking truth to power. Access to funding and resources for youth-led organizations have not improved. Young people are still missing from the tables where peace is being negotiated. Young people continue to be excluded also from parliament, congresses, cabinets and boardrooms where important decisions are being made. While the barriers for youth participation in peace building can be listed for hours and hours, the unique challenges of young women and girls in the same context can be amplified by two because of their gender. Gender roles in society, stereotypes, gender-based violence, harassment online and offline are unfortunately the reality for many young women peace builders around the world. Yet they show incredible resilience and grit in continuing their work. The Youth Peace and Security Agenda is an agenda of inclusion. As we celebrate five years of Youth Peace and Security and 20 years of Women Peace and Security this same year, I want to remind us all that we are not asking for anything impossible. We are asking that our decision making rooms, our boards, our parliaments and our peace negotiation tables be representative of the community we are trying to serve. That means young women, young men and young people in all their diversity have a seat at the table. And I don't think that's asking for too much. Thank you very much for having me again. Thank you very much, uh, Jayatma, for those important and thought provoking opening remarks. And thank you for joining us, even though uh, you will not be able to participate for the remainder of the meeting. I now have the privilege of introducing the two speakers who will be delivering this afternoon's PRIO annual peace address, Hadja Sharif and Ilvad Elman. Libyan peace activist Hadja Sharif co-founded at the age of 19, Together We Build It, a society, a civil society network working to support peaceful democratic transition in Libya. As part of the youth advocacy team of the United Network of Young Peace Builders, she has campaigned for the adoption and implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 2250. She has also worked with the implementation of Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security, co-organizing a network in Libya aimed at promoting the role of women in peacebuilding. Like Ilwood, 
She is an advocate for the Extremely Together initiative against youth, youth radicalization. In 2017, Hasher was awarded the Student Peace Prize for her work on including women in peace building processes. Born in Somalia, Ilvat Elman spent her childhood in Canada before returning to Somalia in 2010 while in her early 20s. There, together with her mother, Fartoon Adan, she co founded and currently leads the Elman Peace and Human Rights Center in Mogadishu. Ilvad was engaged in a number of peace related agendas, ranging from youth activism and peace education to skills training and job creation and fighting gender based violence. Winner of the African Young Personality of the Year at the 2016 Africa Youth Awards, Ilvad was a member of the UN Peacebuilding Fund Advisory Group. Uh, as well as a number of UN uh, uh, expert groups. And as I mentioned, she is also, like Kasher, uh, an advocate for the Kofi Annan Foundation's Extremely Together initiative. She was recently listed by BBC as one of the 100 most inspiring and influential women from around the world in 2020. Although I have followed the convention set by previous PRIO directors in not exercising my right to nominate candidates to the Nobel Peace Prize, it is a tradition that the PRIO directors publishes each year uh, a shortlist of worthy candidates for the prize. In 2019, Hasher and Ilvud, along with Hong Kong democracy activist Nathan Law, topped my shortlist. This was in recognition of these uh, young women's role in promoting and exemplifying the positive contribution of youth to peace and security. And it is for the same reason that I'm very happy to be able to welcome them both today to deliver the 2020 PRIO annual peace address. And I believe Hasher will be speaking first. Please, Hasher. Thank you very much. Thank you, Priya, for dedicating your 2020 annual address to the topic of youth, peace and security. And thank you for inviting me. It is great to see that there is interest in this topic. So to the audience, thank you for coming. For those of you with their cameras off, I hope you are enjoying this event in the comfort of your pyjamas. I must say I envy you. As a starting point for my address, I want to advance three arguments. First, young people are key players in peace and security. Second, the majority of young people in any conflict setting do not choose the violent path. Instead, they mobilize for peace and security. Third, the role of young people in peace and security is still underestimated. For those of you who agree with these arguments, that's amazing. And for those of you who perhaps disagree with one or all of these arguments, I hope that this event will initiate the needed conversation that can convince you on how important the role of young people in peace and security is. So the primary question is, what is youth peace and security? Throughout the world and for decades, young people have been active in promoting peace from anti-wars, mass mobilization, leading protests for social justice to initiating revolutions aiming for democracy. When you look at old photos, perhaps from the anti-Vietnam War, the 2011 revolutions in the MENA region to the Black Lives Matter movement, the majority of people you see in these photos are young people. Young people throughout the history, the present and in the future will continue to take an active stand and role for peace. However, and a big however, while thousands, if not millions of young people play an active role on the ground, which is the informal space for peace, we almost never see young people at peace negotiations, political dialogues, or any other medium for formal peace building. The understanding that you cannot build peace in formal spaces in disconnect from the informal space 
which is the ground level, inspired young people and movements in collaboration with various UN agencies to demand a formal recognition for the role of young people as key players in peace. Thankfully, the UN Security Council listened and adopted Resolution 2250 on Youth Peace and Security. For many young people around the world, UN Resolution Security Council 2250 is an important framework and a tool because it is the first time that young people were formally recognized as key players in peace and security by the highest, if not the most powerful actor in peace and security globally. In my address, I will focus specifically on young people and their participation in formal peace processes and peace building. When we call for young people to be formally recognized as key players in peace and security, and, we, and when we say that young people must participate in peace processes and political dialogues, one of the questions we always face, even if it's posed indirectly, is why? Why young people must participate in peace and security? And I must admit, I hate this question. I truly hate it. When I'm asked that question, my first instant is, why not? Why not? If young people are the mass of peace on the ground, why not include them in political processes? If young people are at the front lines of wars, why not include those young people who are at the front lines of peace building in peace negotiations? Why not? Instead of putting the burden of proof on young people for why our role in peace and security must be recognized, supported, and why we should be included in building formal peace, in my opinion, we should shift the burden of proof. We should ask decision makers, mediators and facilitators and donors who are upholding the current status quo, why don't they include young people? The status quo that favors the violent minority, men with guns, over the peaceful active majority. It is unfortunate that the world has progressed on several social issues, but when it comes to peace and security, it appears that the systems, structures and actors, sometimes even including the UN and the Security Council and the member states, who are the world's leading actors on formal peace and security, are still primarily focused on a state-centric approach to peace building. Where the old, in my opinion, dysfunctional power sharing solution for conflict resolution and peace building is the overarching approach to peace and security. Despite the effective role of young people in peace and security, young people largely remain excluded from formal peace and political processes. It is unfortunate that despite the progression the youth peace and security agenda has witnessed in the recent years, youth groups working on peace and security during extreme difficult circumstances continue to lack long-term program and core funding support that can make the work sustainable. While some armed groups are generously being funded, sometimes even by UN member states, the same donors who give peanuts for peace while they hand out weapons that cost millions and millions of dollars to armed groups. In my organization, the Together We Build It organization, recently we adopted a joke where we would say, next time we write a funding application, we're going to hire an armed group as a consultant because clearly they know how to get unrestricted sustainable funded. Or even better, maybe we should cancel our registration as a civil society organization and register ourselves as an armed group. This way we will have access to more funding, more political support and guarantee a seat at the peace table. It's sad that we're joking about switching sides, isn't it? So, what can we do? What can we do to advance the youth peace and security agenda on our individual capacities, organizational capacity, but also collectively? 
first, we need to redesign the formal peace table where decisions are being made. As someone who is affected by armed conflict and as a peace activist, I strongly believe that peace is a public good. Therefore, everyone should have a say in building and making peace. However, the conventional small peace process, peace table, deals with peace as if it belongs to the few present at the table alone. And those few are almost exclusively senior men. If you give the right to the few to negotiate on behalf of everyone else without creating open and accessible mechanisms for the majority to directly participate, set the agenda and influence the peace table, then we cannot blame the few for negotiating in favor of their own interest. Therefore, I believe that we need to redesign the formal peace table. We need to design a peace table where no single group can be the majority and no single group alone would have the upper hand in the decision making process. We need to ensure that there is a power balance between the men, women and young people sitting in the room and around it. The redesign of the peace table must not only be on basis of equality alone, but equity should be the guiding principle when designing any peace processes. In my experience, when you convey this message to external mediators and facilitators, including the UN sometimes, you are often met with fear. The fear that the peace process will fail even before it starts. They will tell you something along the lines, if we push the negotiating parties to bring young people, they will strike against the process. Or we are afraid if we invite young people to the peace table, the fighting parties will leave the room. These excuses can simply be counter argued because with regards to the fighting parties will strike against the peace process or they will leave the process. In my opinion, it all depends on what the motivations of these actors are at the first place. Because if these groups are fighting to gain political power, then their ultimate objective is to have a seat at the table. They want to be part of the political process, especially when the UN and the Security Council are involved. If these groups are seeking international legitimacy, like in the case of Libya, then they will not strike against the talks or the process and they will not leave it just because you included young people. However, if these groups happen to voice concerns and threaten to leave the peace process because you included young people, then you should understand that it's not the young age they are against, but rather the agenda youth promote. It's the agenda youth bring to the table that scares them the most because they know once you include young people, then the process will highly be influenced by a human rights based approach, which will limit and restrict the fighting groups from reaching an outcome that benefits them the most without taking into account the society and its needs. So in other words, if you exclude young people from peace processes, be aware that you are not excluding their young age, but rather their agenda of a human rights based approach to peace. And you are excluding, in my opinion, one of the best ways to prevent conflicts. The second recommendation I have is that we need to adopt an intergenerational co-leadership approach to peace and security. And to do that, we need to address few important questions. First, how can we bridge the generational divide in the global peace and security movement? And how can we translate that nationally and locally? How can we kick off and build a systematic cross-generational exchange and cross-generational cooperation for peace and security? To answer these questions, we need to first have an informed critical insight on the generational divide itself. And then we will realize the fact that we do coexist in the same place, but we are not always working together. Some of us are ahead while others are catching up. 
these are the questions we at the Together We Build It organization asked ourselves two years ago. And the answers we reached is that we need to co-lead and co-decide for peace and security. Therefore, in 2018, we decided to officially adopt an intergenerational co-leadership approach in our work for peace and security, which also meant that we had to reform our internal structures to be intergenerational. This means that we have a diverse spectrum of ages participating at all levels of our decision making processes from board to senior management to project implementation to setting the agenda and the strategy. As a co-founder of this organization, this is what I'm proud of the most because I know that our work for peace and security reflects the beliefs, opinions and needs of a diverse group, senior, young, even as young as 15 and 16 years old girls. At the Together We Build It organization, we believe in the power of the present and the potential of the future. And this is what personally I believe in as well. However, I don't think we are utilizing the power of the present, which are young people. And I'm for that concerned about the potential of the future, which is the young generations to come. And I'm hoping through this event and in the conversation that we will follow, we will discuss more in terms of the practical steps that we can do together to advance the youth peace and security agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Hashir, for, for those important and excellent reflections, offering both uh, specific challenges and, and concrete recommendations. Uh, I will now uh, immediately turn to uh, the next presentation by Ilvad Elman. Please, Ilvad. Thank you so much, Henrik, for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to join you here today. From my capable co-speakers, we heard how youth have been leading, even in the face of a global pandemic. And from Hadjar, we heard why 2250, why youth, and what a redesign of the peace process can look like. And after so many years of fighting for inclusion and so much further for us to go, perhaps my contributions can just, for a short, short moment on this anniversary, celebrate all that we have achieved. I often find that looking back and reflecting on how far we have come to be an important part of the process to remain motivated, inspired, and determined particularly in a trying field like peace and security. And when I think of the YPS journey, I think fondly on the memory of September 2015, where I believe I had the opportunity to contribute to this historic landmark we celebrate today. In September of 2015, I was in New York with youth from all over the world who were gathered to discuss and share ideas that would, after several intensive and highly inspiring and intentional few days, produce a global youth action agenda to counter violent extremism promote peace, and outline the positive role of youth in peace and security. I had the distinct honor of not only contributing to authoring texts in the Youth Action Agenda, but to take the voices, the key messages, and the passion of the youth that were gathered at the summit before the World Leader Summit at the UN General Assembly that was being chaired by President Barack Obama. There, I presented the agenda. How novel and new, just a mere five years ago, the contributions and voices of young people in a forum like that were on countering violent extremism, on security, in the presence of the world leaders and the UN General Assembly. Not a side event, not a panel, but center stage. And not last on the speaking list either, when everyone has already made their statements and is rushing out of the room to the next meeting. Young people were finally and truly being heard. A few months later, on December 9th, the United Nations Security Council adopted Resolution 2250 on youth, peace, and security. The Youth Action Agenda helped in shaping a global policy framework on youth, peace, and security, and was mentioned in the text of the resolution. The resolution signaled world leaders acknowledged youth's contribution to peace and security and recognized youth's role as crucial partners in building a safer world. For many of us that have been working in these spaces in the face of grave insecurity and against insurmountable obstacles, this presented a new dawn, an entry point to really begin to work together with all stakeholders and actors finally at the table together as equals. It's a real privilege for me to share the stage with two women I greatly admire, 
the formidable Ms. Jayatma, who we just heard from, and my sister in peace, Ms. Hadjar Sharif, who I've had the pleasure of working and growing alongside in our respective leadership journeys for some years now. It was His Excellency, the late Kofi Annan, who first brought us together, who mentored us for three years and challenged us to inspire, empower, and activate our youth peers from around the world to become agents of peace. Under an initiative of the Kofi Annan Foundation called Extremely Together, which Hadra and I till this day are advocates for, and in his memory and in the spirit of his legacy, are paying forward the knowledge he shared with us by training and supporting other youth from all around the world to become peace builders. You are never too young to lead, he said. When former UN Secretary General Ben Ki-moon appointed both Hadra and I as expert advisors on the progress study for Resolution 2250, we gained yet another opportunity to join forces to advance our shared goal of inclusion of peace. I felt both the gravity of the moment, the weight of that responsibility to represent 1.8 billion youth, and knew the importance of what the findings of that report would mean to the future of the YPS agenda and the potential for groundbreaking impact on the way we deal with resolutions of conflict, especially if followed by intensified youth-focused and youth-led peace building for which the resolution lays out the framework. The work of young people on peace and security across different phases of conflict, types of violence and regions of the world is vital, not just because of the size of their demographic group. If the right investments in youth are in place and their peace building work is recognized and nurtured, societies may reap a peace dividend. This is an excerpt from the Missing Peace Report, the independent progress study on youth peace and security. Young people around the world increasingly distrustful of systems of national and multilateral governance that exclude them are forging and claiming new and innovative spaces for political expression, organization, and peace building. Think Black Lives Matter, which grounded in the universality of the oppression and injustice young people face, young people of color and minorities face as the first interface with law enforcement, sparked a global movement that charged by youth. The Sudan uprising and SARS in Nigeria, the list goes on and on. But as noted in the missing piece, there's, however, a tendency to see young people as a threat rather than contributors to peace. As a consequence, young arenas for legitimate action for peace and social justice are often closed down. And in many contexts, they are targeted by governments. Experiences shared by young people indicate that these dynamics are only exasperated under the COVID-19 pandemic. It is therefore vital to not only protect the human rights of young women and men from oppression and physical violations, but to protect and nurture the civic spaces, the formal and informal, the physical and virtual, which they occupy and through which they innovate in building peace. Right now in Somalia, in a region called Galmuduk, a lethal armed conflict between two tribes is ongoing. For nearly a month now, Two tribes that have historically coexisted together in peace, sparked by a land dispute, have taken arms against each other. Where you see him or her, adult or child, that you know to be of the other's tribe, you have a license to kill. Those are the terms, no questions asked. Nearly 200 people are dead now, and it's been a month. It's not the first time entire tribes are called to arms like this. Mostly it's youth that are the gunmen, the lowest hanging fruit, but with the most to lose. Often what will happen is women will plead with traditional elders to call for a ceasefire, but they won't be in the negotiation room when the talk takes place. Where government has influence, it will come with more guns and try to end it. Sometimes there's a formal convening. Sometimes the international community gets involved, engages the traditional leaders and provides resources. Those that have the least to lose, with the most blood on their hands, are tasked with carving the pathway to peace. I see young people in these scenarios as underutilized and underinvested in to prevent armed conflict, and when it ensues, to be activated to end it. In this current conflict I describe, I know that there are youth leadership structures within both tribes. 
they each have an appointed youth leader, indigenous and traditional structures with the tribes that can serve as an entry point for negotiating peace at the front lines. In scenarios similar to the one now ongoing in Galmudit, we have witnessed in Somalia youth refusing to be weaponized against each other for petty things like land disputes. But this was only possible when those youth gained access to resources, safe convening spaces, and skills to resolve conflicts. I know this because through my work at the LMP Center, we've invested in building these capacities in youth before conflict. And we've seen these young people now rise to the occasion when such conflicts are budding. If we know it to have worked before in the past, why do we watch now as this conflict prolongs without applying what youth have already demonstrated as a solution? Prevention, proactive investments in capacities to negotiate, mediate, and resolve conflicts are always better than the cure after the fact. The critical contributions of youth in building durable peace and preventing violent conflicts is recognized by Resolution 2250 and in the subsequent Resolution 2419. Their meaningful inclusion is vital for the implementation of multilateral frameworks such as the SDGs, Sustaining Peace Resolutions, and the wider Women, Peace and Security Agenda. But if these resolutions, recommendations, declarations, and so forth will only be ink on paper, if they are not translated to action plans, localized to each context, committed with budgets, and measured for impact. We've come a very long way in the YPS space and we have so much further to go. Just last month, the world celebrated the 20th anniversary of 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. And we know that much remains to be done to fulfill the promise of 1325 and the Bayesian Declaration. And we know the shortcomings of the comprehensive and meaningful progress that becomes painfully visible when a majority of peace processes still fail to be inclusive. But the YPS journey has had the advantage of learning from 1325. And as a result, developed a truly inclusive, gendered framework for youth participation in peace and security. It is my hope that in another five years from now, or 10, that we not only celebrate how historic 2250 was, but rather the number of conflicts resolved and prevented as a result of the youth engaged in the process as laid out by the resolution. With more than 2 billion people living in countries affected by conflict, on average, post-conflict peace lasting only seven years, and peace still being brokered at tables that do not reflect all of society, it is time that we reevaluate re our current approaches and who's leading them. Thank you. Struggling with the uh, with the mute functionary. Thank you so much, uh, Ilvad, uh, and thank you so much, uh, Hashir, for very inspiring and uh, thought provoking peace address um, speeches. We will now now open up for a panel discussion uh, with uh, the two of you, and also uh, let me introduce um, uh, a. Um, contributor who's, who's going to add further perspectives uh, on the issues under discussion today, uh, namely Mani Hosseini. Mani is the former leader of AUF, the youth wing of the Norwegian Labour Party, and currently also a deputy uh, member of parliament in the Norwegian uh, Storting. Born in Syria, Mani has been an outspoken advocate for a more diverse and inclusive parliament, as well as an advocate for youth inclusion in political decision making through his role in AUF. A very warm welcome to you, Mani. Uh, and I will uh, give the floor now to you to open the panel discussion and uh, provide some initial brief responses to Hasher and Gilbert's uh, addresses. I'm looking very much forward to your comments, Mani, please. Thank you, Henrik. It's a great honor to speak after two great role models for youth commitment around the world. When uh, I listen to Hajer and Ilwad, I think about how lucky we are to live in a country where young people have a natural role at the decision-making table. Well, 
as you said, Hendrik, my political Ill involvement started in the labor youth uh, as uh, 18 years old. And uh, actually it started because I thought it should be better public transport in my town. Uh, it's absurd to, to say it in the, this context, but uh, it's still, it's a genuine commitment. Uh, and uh, I very quickly saw how good the organization, the labor use was, was to embrace our opinions and to put them in order in the system. Uh, when I understood that people in Norway are concerned uh, and the authorities are concerned with what young people think, <laughs> I began to produce many political proposals. Uh, it was unique, it was very different, and uh, for the first time I felt like a democracy builder. Um, as you said, I was born and raised in uh, Syria as a minority, as a Kurdish minority, and uh, uh, knew very well uh, that uh, it was a privilege to speak out, to say your opinion, uh, but coming to Norway and see how it was open for everyone. For me, it was really, it was a great feeling of being a democracy builder. Uh, in the political parties in Norway, the youth organizations, they have privileges. They don't have to fight for it, they have it. They are secured representation and real political power through the party's statutes. And uh, that's important because many think that the parties are doing it to be kind, but that's completely wrong. The Norwegian parties involve youth and they do it because it's the only way they can secure the party's future uh, and that the youth is in control of the party's future. Uh, so they do it as a win-win situation, situation. And uh, I'm saying all that because I know that uh, I have many friends in the Middle East, North, North Africa, and many of them think thinks that the Nordic countries have been peaceful and democratic for many years. Well, that's not true. This is where the Vikings are from. Not everything is peaceful <laughs> in, in, in the history. Well, uh, uh, it was a popular uprising, demands for equality and equality for the law uh, that started the democracy democratization of the Nordic countries. And I'm saying that because I know that in many uh, countries in the Middle East where I have still my roots, um, I know that people don't think that it's a, it's a hope, but when we see it, the Nordic countries, and especially Norway, we see that they have managed to democratize their country in in few decades. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, one of the most important thing is to uh, treat everyone equal, even youth, and that they should be an uh, important part in the uh, uh, political processes because they, uh, they represent a big group of the society and uh, they know also that they are important actors uh, for the future. Uh, the whole future depends whether the youth are uh, happy or not. Uh, and I'm saying that because I look back at the Arab uprising uh, in 2010-11. Uh, what was the main uh, uh, reason for that? Well, it was youth people like me, Hajar Ilwad, who had higher education, wanted to want a job, but they, they didn't get a job. And uh, I think uh, prosperity, uh, secure future, uh, and at the same time involvement in, in politics and open politics for everyone, I think those are maybe key, uh, uh, yeah, key moments to maybe build a democratic and open country like the, the Nordics. I think I will st stop there and I look forward to discuss the rest with you. Thank you so much, uh, Mani, for uh, those additional uh, perspectives um, and, and for also for, for broadening uh, the, the perspective um, uh, and, uh, and putting out uh, some, uh, some uh, openings for uh, the continued uh, discussion. I would like to, to start us off by 
uh, by um, uh, building on that um, uh, point uh, and and the the broader inclusion question of youth uh, in uh, politics and uh, and I think this is absolutely essential because it is underscoring the uh, very significant role that youth have uh, in social and political change uh, everywhere and uh, as, as was noted initially, uh, uh, most youth uh, participate peacefully uh, in uh, in the fight for uh, for political social change. Uh, yet they are uh, absolutely um, essential uh, in uh, in this process. Uh, and as we also know from from research, uh, many of these. Uh, peaceful, uh, non-violent methods of uh, of engaging uh, are also uh, more effective uh, than uh, than violent means in very many contexts. Um, youth are highly mobilizable. Uh, they're increasingly educated. They're globally connected, and they know uh, what they want. Uh, we see youth protests around the globe whether in Lebanon, in Sudan, in Hong Kong, Venezuela, Malawi, uh, Iran, just to mention a few recent cases. Um, I think it would be, uh, with, with your broad backgrounds, uh, would be useful. We've been talking about sort of the broad inclusion measures, but trying also to, uh, to um, arrive at some um, tentative um, uh, impressions of what the best practice for ensuring real representation uh, are. How uh, are youth to be uh, represented? What does inclusion mean in practice? And how do we support and spur institutional formalization? Uh, obviously, there is no one solution, uh, but at the same time, we need to highlight the inspiring cases that can be promoted and replicated. So. In your own experiences, what are these very concrete um, examples of successful inclusion, of successful participation of youth? And if we can start by by you, uh, Hasher, uh, we can we can go in the same uh, order. Absolutely. Um, the question you asked, Henrik, is the one million dollar question for, for everyone, for activists like us, for member states, for governments, for donors, for the UN. Um, the simple answer to that is it really depends. It depends on the context and it depends on the medium itself. But for an example, if I will focus specifically on peace processes, just as an example, but not exclusively, it's really important to know the context of where this is taking place. Because one of the things that I realized and, and I observed from working um, um, with the, in, in Libya is the fact that many of the external mediators and facilitators who, who lead processes on Libya, whether they are formal or, uh, or backdoors diplomacy or, and, and name it all, um, they don't seem to really understand the Libyan context. Um, their conflict analysis seems to be done in a very simplistic way, um, being that group A is fighting group B, so we need to have these groups to, to stop fighting. Who are the leaders of these groups? Let's bring them together. And the end result of this simplistic thinking of how to resolve conflict and to go about peace building is you end up with a tiny table in a huge room. So you have few people coming together negotiating. And once, if that's your peace process, if that's the game in itself, then by default, you don't have rooms for young people because then you're just focusing on the, the problem that you see from outside and there isn't really much room to bring the other perspectives because when you're bringing young people into the room, they don't only want to talk about a temporary ceasefire. They want to talk about this armament, for instance. They don't just want to talk about, OK, how are we going to divide the resources we're fighting about now? They want to talk about economic injustices. So it takes they, they want to talk about real issues, deep issues, and these these issues need time. And that's why I'm saying 
how to include young people, it really depends on the context. Um, for a context like Libya, it's not a conflict that can be solved with one peace agreement or one peace deal. It's a, it's a conflict um, and it's a scenario that needs to be solved on the ground level and then building that all the way to the top. And when it comes to that, you, you can include young people in the various levels of, of the process in itself. Thank you very much, Asher. And, and Ilvad, uh, from, from your um, experience and, and with the breadth also of the uh, Elman Foundation activities, um, can you also share some, uh, uh, perhaps some, some success stories? Sure. I mean, just to also add to what Hadja was mentioning about, you know, meaningful inclusion. I think what that looks like for a lot of young people is one, institutionalizing that making sure that it's not just on the backs of individual champions or that one MP or that one minister who is aware of the agenda and believes in it, but when that person is no, no longer in office, that process not being available for other young people. I think I can very openly speak from a place of privilege where I'm able to influence at both global levels and also domestically in country, but I also know that it's not the same for every young person. So inclusion for me means equal opportunities and institutionalized process. Young people also need the barriers that are in their way to be broken down. I'll give an example on political participation in Somalia. For a young person who wants to be, who wants to run for MP right now, they can't even get their foot in the race if they don't pay $10,000. That's next to impossible. Young people that have great ideas for solving conflicts in their communities can get access to funding if they don't have the funds to register their organizations. So it's also about making sure that there are opportunities for building the capacity so that they can reach these opportunities and requirements to engage with donors. But meaningful inclusion of young people needs to be one that is mindful of the realities, the local realities that young people face in their context. Um, I think it's also important to reimagine what the role of young people can look like for too long. I think the security apparatus has become comfortable with the role of young people in peer-to-peer -peer engagements, in sports, in um, youth mentorship, all important parts of the peace process. But as soon as we start to get involved with reintegration or DDR or hard security measures, threatening issues, mm -hmm. it's no longer our domain. So reimagining the breadth and the full scale in which young people can be involved is necessary to actually push the pendulum further. Um, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Ilad Mani. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for a very good question. And uh, uh, in my opinion, to secure uh, youth inclusion, uh, then the commitment should be organized. And that's, in my opinion, one of the uh, maybe uh, biggest challenges for many youth out there that they don't have an uh, institution or an organization to take care of their rights and, and commitment. This is what we saw in the Arab countries during the Arab uprising, where it was a lot of uh, faith, a lot of uh, commitment, but uh, low degree of, of organizing all this power to actually do something uh, with it. And uh, you asked for, uh, for uh, positive experiences actually, in AUF, my former youth organization, we had uh, many uh, organizational building programs with other youth organizations. So I've been to Uganda, I've been to uh, Southern Sudan, to Lebanon, to Georgia, and helped uh, unorganized uh, youth movements to be organized. And actually what we do, we just learn them basic rules and uh, maybe type down some statutes in order to uh, be equal members. And not as Ilwat said that you depend on some champions or some heroes and they bear, bear all this uh, commitment on their shoulders, but you can uh, democratize the organization in a way or another. And I believe very much in democratization through the grassroots because uh, this is maybe <laughs> one of the problems many uh, in Western countries do when they go to Libya or Somalia or uh, wherever and try to uh, enforce de democracy. Uh, I think you don't start with the, the law, 
you start with the grassroots, find out how you can help them to organize, to advocate, to be funded so they can by themselves write down the constitution and laws. That's how it should be done. And the youth are really, really great uh, uh, players in, in, in this uh, commitment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mani. And, and this is also a, a great segue to, to my next uh, question, which I'm uh, afraid uh, share is going to be tangential to your least uh, favorite question, because back in uh, September this year, I had the privilege of sharing a panel with senior mediators at the Istanbul Mediation Conference. Uh, and it turned out to be an all-male panel, uh, an all-male uh, above uh, uh, you know, a midlife uh, crisis panel and one of the senior mediators uh, relieved a sigh about the inclusiveness agenda, challenging uh, the uh, inclusion of, of uh, uh, women and of youth uh, in mediation process. Uh, he wasn't uh, speaking out against it as such uh, and and uh, and was sort of personal supportive, but he still uh, felt that uh, that um, uh, the, um, the he felt a need to express his concerns that this was primarily uh, tokenism with uh, which potentially could also undermine efficiency if local decision makers uh, are not uh, around the table. Uh, but uh, that what in his view uh, were considered to be sort of Western supported NGOs and agendas uh, were left to dominate. Uh, and, and my uh, question is, is well, to, to what extent is this something from your experience, Silvad and, and um, Hacher, uh, uh, a dominating narrative? And, and how is that uh, challenging the work that you are doing? And, and how do we challenge and alleviate uh, such concerns. Uh, maybe we can go uh, with um, with Ilvad first. This is definitely a narrative that we hear in Somali often as well too, that, you know, the inclusion of women, that the quota, for example, in Somalia, the 30% quota for women to have political participation, it's just a box that the international community wants to tick. It's not something that is um, indigenous or customary in Somali practice. But, I mean, that's the patriarchy. That's the status quo. When there is an opportunity for unconventional actors to have an influx of participation, they will challenge it. And culture is always the easiest thing to mask that under. So it's definitely a discourse that's happening in Somalia as well too, but that's also being drowned out by the overwhelming majority of you know, both older women and a huge population of young women that are demonstrating their ability, their capacity and their interest to be a part of these processes. So it's um, it's challenging on two folds. One, I believe that quotas are definitely necessary in a context like mine because they create that entry point for people, for underrepresented groups to actually have a fighting chance. They also do present a limitation where often they serve as the cap. But for what we need in Somalia right now, they do create that entry point. And if it wasn't for those kind of processes that we expect the international community, we expect friends and believers in democracy and plural societies and human rights to be stout advocates for, if they did not push for it, it probably wouldn't happen in my context. I find that the other side of that discourse is that sometimes women are put in these positions and they're not necessarily representing women. They're not necessarily representing young women. Mm -hmm. But the same argument can be made for men as well too. It's about having the right people in these positions. It's about having opportunities for training and capacity building so that people can grow into their leadership capacity. I'll give you an example of something we're facing in Somalia right now. We have a terrible situation of rampant sexual violence and rape. And for the first time in 2018, the Ministry of Women and Human Rights proposed um, a historic sexual offenses bill that actually would criminalize sexual violence and hold perpetrators to account. It was adopted by the National Assembly, by the parliamentarians. And just a few months ago, that bill was completely destroyed and replaced with the penetration bill. So instead of criminalizing sexual violence, we were now legalizing child marriage. And 
it comes at a time that we're in the election circuit where members of parliamentarians are endorsing and reading and passing things through just so they can have another go at the next term. But the subcommittee that passed this horrendous, abhorrent bill was made of all women. Hmm. And I say this not to at all scar the role of women or to you know, show that not all women are for women, but that's the reality. The reason why we also need flesh, fresh blood, the reason why we need young people, educated members of communities, because they represent a constituency beyond their tribe, beyond their gender, but the ideals that hopefully the whole society can get behind. Thanks a lot. Just a, just a quick follow up because because I think this is um, this is uh, important from the perspective that we uh, that we just discussed about um, about building uh, institutional structures that support sort of the long term uh, uh, promotion of, uh, of social and political change and uh, and um, in in what sense and, and and you were mentioning the quota system. Uh, to what to what extent do you see that uh, that uh, measures like that is uh, is becoming sort of uh, uh, more broadly accepted, and that you're see, see, sort of seeing traces of of uh, uh, of uh, structural um, uh, so the, the the effects of structural investments, if you like, of of uh, things like that, uh, causing real. Uh, sort of social cultural change um, because my you know my my, my expectation is that uh, that we're quite often we're quite often assuming that uh, that uh, what we what we consider to be sort of deep rooted cultural um, uh, aspects are often quite easy to change and and are accepted relatively uh, quickly. So so is that also something that you've seen you know over time in in Somalia? Absolutely. I, I definitely believe that fully. And Somalia is, is, is quite unique because we've been in conflict for 30 years, but the regress that we've made in the subjugation, the oppression, and the, the violence against women and exclusion of them in the public space, it's one generation young. 70% mm. of the population is under the age of 30. 44% of that is under the age of 15. We are dealing with a nation of children, essentially. Children that have only ever known war at the most malleable, fundamental phases of their lives. And I've seen young people that have been involved with extremist organizations, young people that have overcome a horrific tragedy, still being optimistic mm -hmm. and participating and contributing to peaceful processes because they have so much of their life still ahead of them. But with meaningful engagement and investment in time, not quick fixes, not short impact projects, but an education, they are able to contribute to the future and there's a lot of appetite for it. Mm. I, um, it. This is most relevant to what we're facing right now in Somalia, where for the last four years with the federal administration, the international community and donors of Somalia have invested significantly in building the institutions and didn't make the parallel investment in society, in youth development, in civic participation, in voters education, in civic education. So you have systems that are not happening together. And I believe the future really is also in ensuring that young people are invested in the same effort that institutions are getting. Thank you, Abad. Um, Hacher, uh, to, returning to the to the initial question about, you know, the uh, this least uh, favorite question of yours and, and the challenges that uh, that you're uh, you're facing uh, when it comes to the uh, these narratives about uh, about inclusion. What's uh, what's your uh, your experience in, in that regard? Yes, you know, it, it doesn't matter the number of times um, this question comes across. Um, I still get equally provoked, if, if not more. Um, and the re I, I, I have my justifications for that. Um, Henrik, you mentioned something very important when you were referring to what the mediator said. You said he felt and even though you're speaking, you're, you're um, um, reporting on what he said, but I can say that literally almost every mediator I spoke to, at least those who, mediators and facilitators who are involved on Libya, when they talk about women and young people's inclusion in the Libyan peace process, they always talk from their perspective. They say, we think, we feel, 
we view from our experience, it should be like this and this and that. And honestly speaking, that is where they get it wrong. Because if as a mediator and a facilitator, if you're coming to a conflict, ultimately believing that your opinions is what should design the peace process, it's not going to work, first of all. Second of all, you don't have the right to do that. If you are a mediator um, um, mandated by the UN, um, you have your mandate that comes from the UN, you have your mandate that comes from the Security Council. When it comes to youth inclusion, it's a very clear mandate. You have Security Council 2250 that says young people must participate in UN-led processes. So these mediators and facilitators should depart from that point onwards. Instead of going backwards and saying, well, we fear or we think, um, in, in my opinion, that shouldn't be possible. And, you know, in, in uh, my work with the Together We Build It organization, two years ago, we launched a campaign called You're Missing the Full Picture. And it was directed specifically towards members of the international community and the UN mediator to Libya at that time, where we were saying, you don't get the full picture of Libya because when we see you sitting in a room mediating a peace meeting between the Libyan actors, we are not seeing the Libyan society because if you go out, you will see women in the street, you see young people in the street and not only living their daily lives normally, but you see them active. There is a woman movement, there is a young youth movement that is calling specifically to be included in the decision making processes. So for these mediators and facilitators, I say you don't have to build anything from scratch. As a matter of fact, don't think that you're bringing young people into the table. It's more about you're just designing an inclusive peace process that is a representation of the society. And, you know, once we once this is the response we give, then uh, we're labeled all of being idealistic. Uh, we don't you know, we don't really understand the severity of of how things are on ground. And they will tell you, you know, people are dying. We need to stop it. And and it's it's sort of humiliating because you're like, well, I'm a Libyan. I feel how people are dying. And the reason I'm saying it needs to be an inclusive peace process because I don't want to die. I don't want them to die now and I don't want them to die in the future. But from the perspective of what we've seen so far in Libya when it comes to the mediation and facilitation of peace processes, it's it just feels that they are in a rush, you know, they're they like. I don't know what they're in Russian, but it feels that they are in a rush and they just have to get out with a peace deal. That honestly, it means nothing for the people inside. It means such a big deal on Twitter and the statements and the welcoming and the handshakes and the pictures. It looks glamorous, but on real in reality and on the ground, it doesn't make any difference. Thank you very much. These, I, I think, are great uh, ways of countering uh, that that narrative. And I should add also that uh, that uh, he certainly was was met with some resistance from the other uh, males in the in the panel. Uh, just so uh, so that's on the record. Money, uh, do you want to uh, to comment on this as well? Well, I, I of course agree with Hajir and. Uh, Ilwad, uh, there are, <laughs> uh, even though in Norway we are in different uh, contexts and uh, I can't imagine uh, how tough uh, processes you are going through, still it is here. It is something to push the youth down. Uh, even when we get tough on different, uh, uh, different topics, for instance, climate change, uh, which is a huge topic in Norway, and it, you can say that it it uh, divides uh, divides the youth against the the old industry uh, uh, people see in Norway coming from a poor country to a rich country, and you see that uh, division, and of course. Uh, even in my party, when we are at the decision table, we we can we can see some of uh, uh, that. Uh, you said, uh, Hajir, that uh, we youth are being idealistic. We don't see the whole picture. We don't understand that. And in that way, we shouldn't 
be in the decision making. I think uh, that can be translated to all different positions. And again, in my uh, opening uh, uh, note, I said that it has to be uh, uh, everyone should be tre treated uh, as equals. In that, I'm saying that also everyone should have the same to say. So an old man, 50, 60 years, like my father, uh, he is born in the Middle East and he's always right. And you know, guys, what I'm talking about. Well, uh, I have lear learned him after 20 years in Norway that that is not, a, not the truth, that uh, also we, the youth, we have some opinions and, uh, uh, well, we have the same right as him, as his generation, to claim our rights, uh, because this is what it is about. Thanks uh, a lot, uh, Mani. Um, we, we've talked about, you know, the, the of course, the, the principled issues of uh, of youth inclusion. Um, youth is uh, is uh, of course a a demographic category. Whether or not you you set the uh, uh, the dividing lines here or uh, or there, but. Um, uh, if you look at youth as a demographic category to get some uh, sense of the extent of the challenges, uh, we know that globally we have reached uh, what we may call peak youth. Uh, we are at the level now uh, we, um, at which the number of youth in the world is not going to increase uh, massively beyond what we uh, have now. However, the geographical distribution is, is highly unequal. Uh, while, for instance, countries like uh, like Libya is uh, is starting to see uh, youth courts coming down. If if you look at at sub-Saharan Africa as a region, uh, and as uh, as uh, Ilvad was uh, was mentioning uh, with Somalia, uh, having a very youthful population. If you look at sub-Saharan Africa uh, overall, the number of youth aged 15 to 24 will almost double between now, 2020, and, and uh, uh, 2050, uh, from a little bit more than 200 million to close to 400 million youth in only uh, 30 years. And of course, this is this is uh, it's important to acknowledge uh, the the very considerable challenge that this is posing uh, to providing opportunity uh, to uh, large youth cohorts in order to be able to uh, make good use of the resources that uh, youth represent. Uh, and uh, you know, the, my very broad and uh, and uh, I guess unfair question to you all is is how. Can we uh, engage governments and, and the international community um, in, in, in ways of uh, um, creatively and uh, constructively engaging uh, with what I see as a, as a quite um, massive uh, uh, and uh, an important uh, challenge? And maybe uh, if we can start with, uh, with Hasher now. Thank you, Henrik. Um, the one important thing I want to note is that when it comes to young people's participation in decision making general, um, whether on a political level or, uh, or specifically in peace processes, etc., I think it's just important to, to note the fact that not everyone wants to become a full time activist um, or, or a peace activist. If, if you can give me the choice, that's not the the first thing I'll pick. It's uh, um, it's it's something that is more forced on many of us, and that having that in mind, it influences on how we can um, um, provide opportunities and a platform for young people to participate in decision making processes. Similarly to the rest of the the, the groups and the society. Um, some young people are 100% interested, others are maybe 50%, others are maybe 20%. So there is a variety when it comes to that. And this is something important to keep in mind when providing opportunities or, or redesigning structures of participation, because the departing point should be that every young person should be able to participate and should have accessible methods, tools and platform to participate directly or indirectly in any decision making process. So that should be the bare minimum just to establish the right of young people to participate. And that goes to what I was mentioning earlier in my address is that it's not enough to say 
we are equal. It's not enough to say, well, young people are equal to other groups of the society. They can, if they choose to participate, they can participate. Because as Ilwad and, and other speakers mentioned, that there are, are systematic barriers. Um, Ilwad gave the example of the payment they have to make, but also when you look at the age um, of, of people who are eligible to run for offices all around the world, the, the threshold, the age threshold is very high um, when it comes to the age of voting, for an example. So if we're setting, um, um, if we're telling young people, well, you cannot formally participate until you are 18, we're sort of expecting them to suddenly have is switch in their mind and, and how they think after 18 years of their life. And now we're coming to them and saying, well, congratulations, you won the political lottery. Now you can go and vote. Um, so it's really important, as I said, just to establish the right that young people should have the right to participate. And when we're designing these structures and platforms, we need to have equity in mind. So it's not in, it's not just enough to say, well, if a young person is interested to participate in decision making, when they turn 18, they can do that. Or when they turn 40, they can run to become the president. It's important to, to know in advance and also provide um, the platform that can prepare them and raise awareness of young people when it comes to the importance of participating in decision making processes. Thanks, uh, Asher. Uh, Ilvad? In Somalia, groups like Al Shabaab, which literally translates to the youth, understand the power of young people. But the demographic dividend of youth, not only in Somalia, but in most parts of Africa, is feared mm. by leaders. Mm. My God, just what's happening right now in Nigeria and SARS is, I think, a prime example of young people wanting to be protected, to be heard, and to stand for their rights, and are being killed. The huge youth bulge of young people. I think in Africa particularly is what's needed to develop the continent. In Somalia, we, we look at the huge unemployment rate of young people and the post construction development needs of the country and youth development as a nexus of that. What could be seen as an opportunity is viewed as a burden. And the biggest threat to peace and stability and prosperity is not idle young people. It's the threat of exclusion, of exclusion. When young people don't have a safe space for political dissent, when their ideas can't be heard, when their only interface with authority is that of violence, they will organize. And what we see all over the world is that young people are not waiting anymore to be included. They're creating their own systems and structures and organizations on the margins. And it's in the interest, I think, of all supporters of peace to support them in this process. I think it's quite inspiring to see that young people reclaim the future that they believe they deserve. Mm. And the Missing Peace Report and the Resolution 2250 show us how young people at the majority want to contribute to peaceful processes and are not violent or perpetrators. But we don't need to make the argument anymore of what do we do with youth? Will they become violent? Is there a big question mark on them? We have empirical evidence to show that they are majority peace builders. I think that's a, that's a great uh, comment. And I think um, while governments are generally, when we talk about the, the demographic dividend, the, the contributions of youth, uh, I think governments are, are generally embracing the potential economic uh, demographic dividend, but, but are much more concerned about what we may call the social or political dividends, uh, the, the dividends that uh, that are coming out of uh, of the change, the social and political change that youth are demanding. Uh, and, and I think uh, it's sort of a, a, a major uh, issue pertaining to uh, to uh, the uh, the sec securitization, if you like, of, uh, of youth is precisely that governments are fearing and hence not investing uh, in uh, what they see as uh, factors that can spur perhaps 
uh, this uh, this social and political change that youth are uh, are representing, whether that is education, whether it's uh, facilitating for rural to urban uh, migration, or uh, if uh, if it's other factors that uh, that affect you know these these crucial um, uh, these crucial dynamics. Um, uh, Mani, uh, do you want to comment on this as well? Well, uh, I must say that uh, I completely agree with the Ilwad. No one is born to be violent. Uh, people uh, are put in that uh, situation and then youth as well. And uh, if you don't look at the youth as a resource to invest in, well, they will get a problem for you. It, it is uh, as easy as it is. So in my opinion, the, the first thing many of these countries should do is to give the youth faith in the future that the future would be better than now. And that's a start, a good start. And then in, uh, in order to achieve that, well, then you have to invest, as you said. You have to invest in education and you have to give them the belief that there is a job waiting for them when they are uh, finished with their education. Uh, so so it's, a <laughs> it's a very easy answer with a great, great uh, responsibility for those countries, even Norway. We see that uh, uh, one of the uh, um, major challenges between youth people is that people fall outside the society, and it often start with with the with the school, and then then they're outside. So, uh, as you said, Henrik, I totally agree. We have to invest in youth, invest them in their education and job, but also give them the opportunity to say their uh, uh, opinions. In Norway, we have something co called student councils, which uh, actually we start with in the in the high school, and that's uh, <laughs> that's a way of starting uh, youth to be engaged or commit committed to their school and the facility of the school, and if, if we have water there, uh, water machines or not. This is this is a quite uh, simple way of introducing. Uh, the right to, to 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 say your opinion and the right to be a part of the decision making, and I think that's something many more should do. You don't have to wait till you are 18 to 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 make your claim of your um, democratic right. Thank you very much, uh, Mani. We're uh, unfortunately, I have to say, nearing the end of our time. Um, but I would like to to ask you sort of a quick question towards the end and. And uh, perhaps reflecting a little bit on the way that that uh, that we are talking about youth, because we tend to talk about youth as uh, as it was a, a uniform group. At the same time, we know that there is great diversity within uh, between youth, uh, not uh, only between youth of different countries. Uh, it, often, to to some degree, there the diversity is greater within countries across social class, across identity groups. Uh, class regional categories such as urban uh, rural and and these inequalities in terms of access to education access to jobs access to to uh, politics is is uh, can, can be you know in 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 some cases uh, quite extreme um, and um, the, the question is how do we square this into uh, this discussion how how do we create uh, uh, opportunities for all youth, and I I, uh, I realize that that's a that's a broad question, but I, I would like some some very quick reactions. And maybe Mani, if we can, uh, because you uh, after all you have the the political background from uh, from the labor youth, you know, working to uh, to fight uh, dedicated to fight uh, you know social uh, social inequality, and and uh, you know how uh, how can we uh, not not only you know reflect on on youth as a group, but also. Uh, manage to talk about uh, the the special needs of uh, special groups of youth. You need to unmute. There is a classic teams uh, failure. Well, uh, um, thank you, Henrik. I could uh, speak a lot about uh, this topic. Uh, to make it very very short, I think. Uh, we should uh, uh, look at the youth uh, as uh, uh, the future, but also uh, treat them at, as something uh, uh, with us now. And uh, what, what, I be, what I mean about that is to invest in them, to take, uh, take them in the decision making. And uh, I am uh, a bit against to divide the youth in different groups because then they lose power. Uh, 
so in my opinion, keep them as a group, speak about them as a group. This is what we have done in the labor youth, and we have gained a lot of power in, in doing that. But of course, different youth groups have different challenges and they should be addressed. But when claiming power, be one movement. Thank you very much, uh, Mani. Uh, Hasher, would you like to share anything on, on that note? Absolutely. You know, Henrik, this question is also another question that is posed um, when with my work when we say, well, we need young people to be involved and you need to invite them to peace processes. And the question is then, OK, what what type of young people exactly? And sometimes it's followed by how many? Um, and my our answer has always been all. Um, not restricted to a certain group of, of young people um, or a special type um, or group of young people. And that takes us also to the reason why as an organization we said, OK, we decide to go formally and officially intergenerational because while I I'm considered a young person. Um, I'm not really that young in my organization when I have girls who are 15 years old, you know. Um, and and when if we're talking about what youth want, it's also important for us as young people, as a youth movement or youth group, is to also ensure that we are inclusive ourselves, you know, not only when it comes to the diversity of numbers, I'm 27, there are other young people who are active who are 20 and 15, but also bearing in mind that all of these young people come from different backgrounds. So that's also a responsibility that should be on the youth um, organizations and the youth groups themselves as well. Thank you very much, Hasher. Ilvad, final comment? I would actually go as far as saying that I think the youth agenda should serve as a model for our other processes because it's the most intersectional. When we look at the youth agenda from the way even the resolution was developed and from the progress study report, consultations happened all over the world. We reached the hardest to reach demographic of young people across different ability and disability and rural and urban. And I think youth processes, youth led organizations are what governments and I think what donors and I think that the international multilateral partners should aspire to. We, I think, have achieved and advanced beyond the other actors in the peace and security space. Um, I think that we also look at peace and security from a much wider continuum. We engage at the bottom and at the global. And I think from the speakers that we have here in this conversation, we also represent how we keep both one foot at the local and one in the global to really inform the recommendations that we pose. So, um, and I don't think that's a bad thing to say, that youth are actually leading the way in inclusion through inter intersectionality. <laughs> that's a great way to uh, to wrap it up. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ilvad. And uh, and this concludes the, uh, the 2020 PRIO annual peace address. Uh, again, like uh, to to just extend my uh, gratitude to uh, to all of our participants today, uh, to Hasher Sharif and to Ilva Delman, uh, as well as uh, Jayatma uh, Vikramanayake uh, and Mani Husaini. You all helped make today uh, the discussion we've had an illuminating and poignant one, raising extremely important questions and framing them uh, in a way that allows us to do uh, future work on the youth peace and security agenda. Many thanks to all those of you who have been watching uh, today's event live. Uh, we'll, as I said at the beginning, also be posting a recording online on Prio's website so that many more people around the world will have the opportunity to watch today's event. Uh, please do go to our website and share the link to the recording with all those you think might find it interesting uh, and inspiring. And then I would also like to take the opportunity to remind you that there is a resource page on our website with a curated list of relevant PRIO research. Uh, and you'll find a link to that on the event page for uh, this event on the PRIO site. And
And then uh, to our speakers, you will, had you been here in person, you would have received the uh, the fine uh, Prio print. We will, of course, make sure to ship that to you uh, in your uh, current locations and hope that you will be uh, able to uh, enjoy it uh, on your walls when they arrive. Thank you again uh, so much and goodbye.